Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and I am so delighted that Leica asked me to come back to guest host a very special, very personal episode of their new series called Leica Conversations. Uh, Leica's objective with this free series of conversations and live streams is to inspire our visual storytelling uh, and connect with the larger community. And I really like that. So that's just another reason that I'm really glad to be here. Wow. With this said, I have a lot of notes. I'm going to be referring to them often, so forgive me. Uh, but today we're going to go behind the scenes of this year's 40th anniversary. Whoops. Oh, I gave that away. I wanted to hold that up for a second. Okay. That's why I'm really excited. Put it up. Put it up. <laughs> this is why I'm really, I'm really excited because I get to sit down and have a conversation. I get to introduce to you a side of Joel Myrowitz, who you may, uh, which you may not know. I mean, Joel is a legendary photographer, but he's also a writer, an educator. I think he's more than a little bit of a philosopher and a poet. And as I've come to know him over the past couple of weeks, he is a genuinely nice human being. So in fact, uh, it was because Joel is a juror at LOBA, the Leica Oscar Barnack Awards, if we can go forward a little bit. So uh, LOBA is a nomination only jury driven photo competition, uh, which they say recognizes and honors photographers whose, I'm gonna quote this here, unerring powers of observation capture and express the relationship between man and the environment in the most graphic form. Because it's an annual event, the way I think of it is that it is a competition to capture the zeitgeist. So this is really, really interesting to me. Now, to do this, to go behind the scenes, we're going to speak with a juror, and not just any juror, it's Joel. The thing about this particular uh, 40th anniversary event is that in breaking from past tradition, each photographer was asked to submit between 15 and 20 images, a body of work. And as Joel and I talk, you're going to learn why that's so important. Uh, but what I want to do really, the, the goal for me, is to explore this particular juror's own origin story, how he came to be who he is today, how that journey has impacted not only his photography, but how he sees and judges the works of others. But our ambition is to go even deeper than that. And Joel has very graciously accepted the challenge while simultaneously keeping, in me, keeping me in suspense, which is very tough because I've been waiting for weeks for his answer to a single question I posed to him, not photographer to photographer, but man to man. So Joel, thank you for playing with me on that. So I'm going to reintroduce you because it really is my honor and privilege to introduce someone who is recognized around the world as one of the most important street photographers of his generation, one of the most important street photographers, period, um, a pioneering artist in the use of color, a highly influential teacher, and who I also think beyond being a wonderful writer, poet, philosopher, educator, He's a father, he's a son, he's a brother, he's a husband, and he's a friend. And I, I think we sometimes get so caught up in the label of photographer or gear that we miss that at the end, this is all about humanity and the human behind the camera and the humans in front of the camera. So Joel, again, thank you. Hello. Wow. <laughs> well, I, uh, and you know exactly why I'm so chuffed about this. So uh, there was something that you said in your master class when you were about to review the work of one of your students. And I want to quote you on this. You said, my intention is to look at the work and to see if I can find in the photographs qualities that describe to me as a stranger, essential values that the artist brings to the work. If I can find the identity of the human being who made the photographs, 
in the photographs. I have never seen a more economical way of expressing the notion of the artist's voice. Well, what else are you looking at when you look at a photograph? I mean, it's a, a little self-contained story. It's about a place or people. And you look at it for its formal properties, perhaps. But behind it is the person who made it. Not just their eye, but their life experience, their sensitivity, their risk-taking characteristics, you know? So when I look at a body of work in particular, I mean, it's much harder with a single picture. Let's be honest, it's a picture. But when you look at a body of work, as I did with the Loba jury, I'm trying to see besides the story the artist is telling, who are they? Are they revealing anything to me about their um, most intimate qualities? Or are they just telling me a story because they're in you know, uh, Russia and they're dealing with the radiation in Chernobyl, or they're in on some island in which, you know, the population is dying. Are, are they feeling something about this or is it just eyeballing it? And I think too often photography slips into this uh, way of describing the world where the artist becomes invisible. The pictures are there, but it's all about story. And because I've never really been a true documentary photographer working to tell stories for hire, I've always believed that reading photographs, because every photograph has an, an indelible text built into the photograph. And I want to see if I can find the text and within it find something of the humanity of the person who made it. And when I look at the very best work over the history of photography, 180 years of history, I can see who Ache was or August Sander was, or at least to me, you know, it's not that it's a perfect description of them, but I get a sense of who that man was or who Diane Arbiz was in her curiosity and her relationship to people. Or how come Bresson could make the kinds of pictures he made? Who was Bresson? And, and it goes on and on with, with every artist of any significance. If you look deeply into the work, you should find entree into the persona of that person. And thus, the work has an added dimension. It has the human dimension rather than purely photographic pictorial dimension. It's fantastic and interesting that you mention uh, Cartier-Bresson and trying to understand who he is. Uh, he has such an interesting background. As those of you who know me, uh, you've heard this before, apologies, but I spent enough time going through his background to understand that he was actually born into one of the 200 wealthiest families in France at the time of the rise of the Industrial Revolution, in particular uh, uh, textile mills. And that affected how he saw the world and what opportunities he had to see the world. So I, I hear you. I mean, I'm vibrating, but I was doing that the first time we met. <laughs> I want to share with you uh, another uh, quote. Uh, I'm not going to bother saying who said it, but it wasn't you. Uh, okay, I say it. The images we choose to see, capture, and cherish most are a function of the sum total of our life experiences up until the moment we trip the shutter. Now, maybe it's because I read too many comic books uh, or read too many as a kid, or maybe I should have watched fewer Marvel and DC Comics movies, but I really do tend to think of this as mining mm. one's own origin story to find one's artistic voice, which is what this is uh, all about. Now, you talked about Loba <laughs> and you talked about what you were looking for. So I think there are two other things that come into play. It's what it is about your life which lets you see these images the way you do. But it's also about the nominators, right? Because each of them is an individual with a life's of, a worth of experience as well. Yeah, well, I mean, let me say first that I, I, it was a privilege to 
be on the Loeb jury because I had a chance to see 45 or 50 photographers, maybe 15 of them, I can't remember the number exactly, are sort of new, new upcoming artists and the others were more established, although I didn't really know them or their work. So I did have a chance to, at, you know, in one bolt, uh, see a lot of work and a lot of really good work. The uh, the fact of the selection a priori before it was my turn to eliminate from the final selection along with the other jurors, the, the overall selection chosen by like a, uh, um, you know, people, editors, um, felt to me to be um, sort of focused on a storytelling about the you know, what's wrong with the world today? I don't quite remember what the the um, demand of this uh, uh, jurying was, but it, it felt like it was all stories about the things that are really bad in the world today, you know? Global warming, the dying off of animal life, you know, the collapsing of cities, the, you know, the, the continent falling away underneath our feet. I mean, it, it was a lot of bad news frankly. And a lot of photographers rose up in the telling of this bad news. I shouldn't say a lot. Some photographers rose up in the telling of this bad news and saw the, the human failing of it. And a lot of people, I felt, good photographers, quick on their feet, good eye, you know, good exposure, being in the right place at the right time. But it was as if the story was driving them so hard that a bit of their humanity slipped away. Whereas I, I didn't feel often enough the tenderness as they witnessed the crap that they were looking at. Their, I didn't feel their hearts opening. I saw their eye open. I saw the camera with the right lens. And, but I, that was a dimension that was missing to me. And although the sum total of each photographer's work had a, an engaging story in it, I think there's more. And I don't think it's wrong to demand more from this kind of work. Because when you look historically at the great stories that were done in the heyday of Life magazine and Look magazine and in the big picture magazines of the 50s and 60s and before and after, you do see some stories that are heartbreaking. And the photographer was stunned by what he or she saw and, and, and at times rose up to the humor and, and the irreverence of it. And so I, I, was, I was hoping to find a little more of that, more than just competence and timeliness and, and all the qualities that, you know, we revere in good documentary photography. So I was a little on the fence with some of it. And yet there were some really stirring stories there. Some that didn't win, but that were nonetheless really telling. Uh, I mean, things that pulled at me. So, you know, it's always a mixed bag when you're looking at 50 plus photographers and you're only gonna give away a dozen wards or whatever it is, it's, you know, it's a lot to cut away and to agree I, on. <laughs> I, I, I so get this. I, uh, I shoot street, you know what I do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always said that I shoot street photography because in that moment of casual connection, because most of the time I ask, because it's that process that I enjoy so much. It reaffirms for me that the world is not a uniformly terrible place. And the headlines and the reality of where we are, the zeitgeist of where we are, really is kind of once in a hundred years uh, proposition. But I get completely, uh, when you talked about uh, mid-century photographers, I'm thinking of Dorothea Lange. Her, she comes through in her photographs of the Japanese internment camps in the mm. United States. Mm. Her humanity comes through with that photograph of the migrant mother. Jean Smith, 
uh, whether it's a, a day in the life of a country doctor or the, the coal streaked faces of Welsh miners, their, their humanity comes through. So I really, really get that. But now I want to go to you. I want to spend the rest of the time on you. I want to really dig into your journey, your origin story. And guys, the way that, that I proposed to do this is uh, I'm going to share with you, if you can only get two books, if you can only get two books, this is one of them. It's Where I Find Myself. And this, is, uh, this was published, I think, in 2017, Joel. Is that right? I think eight, 2018, I okay. think. All right. Okay. I just I just got the Close latest, I just got the latest uh, printing of it. It just came this morning. It's the fifth printing, and it's at you know, like almost twenty thousand copies sold. So the, the book is doing its job. Well, it it really is because it is a wonderful way to understand as much of Joel's life as he's cared to share in print, and it's actually quite a good deal. So I, I really, I highly recommend that. And in fact, we're going to use that as natural progression uh, to, to tell his story and his life. But the one other book that I would recommend is this one, Cape Light. Now, Joel, I don't think when we spoke last time, I told you that, that Claudia and I have been up to Provincetown and we've cycled through Provincetown. <laughs> And so just seeing these images really brought a bunch of things home to me. But the reason why I'm mm -hmm. recommending it to everyone else is because, and we'll get into this uh, shortly, Joel shot these images with an eight by 10 inch Deerdorf camera on a six foot tripod that he carried around with him. And there is something ineffable and sublime in these images that of all the books that I've seen from Joel thus far uh, is best captured here. Um, Joel, if you just want to say something about that book and then we'll circle back. You, you bookended me with my first book and my last book. <laughs> <In these two. laughs> Nothing happened in the middle? Um, just 30 other books, I think. Anyway, yeah, that was a departure. The Cape Light book was a departure. I, I was at a point in my life where I had been photographing for 14 years at that point. And I was going through a transition in the early 70s in which I was, uh, I started in color in 62. By 63, I started shooting black and white. I shot black and white in color alternatively and together for those 14 years, but by the mid 70s, I decided no more black and white. And I was trying to undo the things that I had learned, because I think if you learn how to do something really well, and you, you're just good at it all the time, or satisfying at it, let's say for yourself, that's the time to let it go. Because otherwise you're gonna be tempted to plateau along that line of successfully made photographs again and again. And so I wanted to challenge myself in ways to make a different kind of 35 millimeter street picture in which the, the incident was no longer the centerpiece of the picture. I don't just mean in the center of the frame, but wherever you put it in the frame when you're, when you're moving that frame around on the street. And so I wanted to give up the incident and work in color, which meant I had to step back further away from the seven or eight feet that I usually worked at to more like 15 or 18 feet so that I could have the depth of field. This isn't going to be technical, don't worry. But the depth of field so that I could read the whole street because color is such a powerful descriptive tool. I wanted everything in the field to be described so that I could release myself from hanging the picture on the hook of the incident. There's a lot to give up. You know, when I showed these pictures to Gary, or to Todd Papa George, they would look at me like, what happened? Where's the picture? Uh, you know, and I'm saying, no, no, you don't understand. I'm giving that up. I'm trying to make a new kind of picture. I don't want to be the decisive moment street photographer in, in that mold any longer. I want to see 
what else can I say? Anyway, bit by bit, I kept on feeling that the description of everything in the field, even though Kodachrome was beautiful, it wasn't enough. And I had heard John Tchaikovsky once say, he was the head of Museum of Modern Art for 30 years. He's the guy who made photography what it is today. He's the guy who brought it into the public eye so that we are where we are. And John once said, look, all you do, you know, you press the button on the camera and it describes everything in front of the camera. And I misread that as meaning, oh, description is everything. So by trying to describe the whole field with 35, the pictures were interesting for sure, and they're in that book. But I at some point felt I wanted even greater description because I wanted to make bigger prints. And in 1976, nobody was making prints bigger than 16 or 20 inches. <laughs> and so I got myself a view camera and I started to make pictures and immediately started making prints at 40 inches. Sometimes even bigger, but 40 became like, you know, that's the size. You want a, you want a window? I'll give you a window to look at the world. And in order to learn how to use that camera, uh, I had to get out of the city for a summer. And Cape Cod, Provincetown, offered an interesting combination of a place that was really a peninsula surrounded by water on three sides, with ponds in the middle. <laughs> and it had a really active street life, very much like 8th Street in Greenwich Village in New York City. So there, I had the dynamic of a street life and I had the landscape and the spaciousness of the Cape. It allowed me to try to figure out what I could do with this eight by 10 camera. So this book, in a sense, is my learning tree. You know, I got in, this book is made out of two summers, probably all told 600 negatives or maybe 700 negatives. But I, I learned my craft with the eight by 10. I learned how to find the other side of my personality. Because I, I think of myself as a street photographer playing jazz. It's a riff all the time. You're watching things move on the street and you're trying to find yourself in the right place. How do you get there when the action peaks? It's very jazzy. And the large camera is like hauling a cello around with you everywhere. It's slow, it's big, it's, 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 um, it, it needs a more meditative approach. And the cape slowed me down enough for me to take it in so that the simplicity of light falling on siding, <laughs> as simple as that, was enough for me. And I began to understand that there's another vocabulary. And, and I'm grateful that I started on the street because I could make the, the, the turn, I could pivot to the big camera comfortably because I already had an aesthetic. I think it would have been harder if I was starting with the view camera and then trying to give that up and go to the street. I don't know if I would know how to dance, you know, on my, on my feet that way. So that's what I think you're talking about is that, that, that persona. I mean, I made a discovery that I was, I was a split personality. <laughs> well, I, the, the thing that really strikes me about this story and strikes me about your work, the point that I want to amplify right here is that like the best painters, you know, Picasso had his blue period. Uh, and before, well before that, he was first an extraordinarily gifted draftsman. I mean, he could sketch realistically incredible, like Dali, same kind of thing. And it was only once that they had mastered the, the basics, the essentials, that they could then go off in their own direction. But you are someone who has refused to be bound by a single genre, and that reflects your own growth, I think. You can tell me that I'm wrong. As a human being, and I think about uh, you know some of the best musical acts ever getting 
constrained by what their audience wants. Just roll out the oldies, the goodies, the ones we know, and you kept going forward. So I think this is actually a wonderful time to shift gears and now go all the way back and then go forward again. Because as we move forward, uh, there are a number of images that you uh, uh, were so kind as to, to let us share. But I want to place those in context of your life. This sounds a little bit like that TV show, Your Life. I didn't mean that. This is your life. Let's Bring start. out the people that I haven't seen in 50 years. Well, yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So, so uh, no, we're not doing that. Well, there are a couple. But let's start with what I like to call BP, you know, before photography. I'm talking about the years from 1938 to 1962. And I just love it if you could share with people a little bit about how and where you grew up. What did you see? How did you become a, from a zygote to Joel Meyerowitz in 1962? We're going to get there. But as much as you care to share, I think it would be fascinating yeah. for people to hear. Because I, I keep thinking that every single one of us has a unique story. And that's the place to mine one's artistic voice. Well, that little zygote that I was was really smart because I found a great egg and my mother had it. And she launched me like, like a projectile into the world. <laughs> and immediately, as soon as I landed, I woke up and said, I'm a photographer, but I just don't know it yet. I'll be there. Hang out 24 years from now. I may get there. I grew up in the Bronx in a working class family in a kind of neighborhood that you might call a ghetto now. Um, but it was, uh, it was a kind of wonderful part of the Bronx. It was um, filled with immigrants. There were Italians and Irish and Germans and Jews. And, and uh, the mix was, you know, sort of pre-World pre War II and post-World War II. So there was an interesting um, sort of small town dynamic. The subway was on the corner of my block. I could get on that subway and be downtown in 30 minutes in the, in the heart of Times Square. But in the Bronx where I was, it was a sort of country. There was a little river that ran by. We caught turtles and frogs and, and bunnies and you know, snakes. So I had this kind of wildlife and street life. And my father was considered the mayor of the block. He was... Uh, well known, he was a Golden Gloves boxing champion, so he had a reputation in the neighborhood as being a guy who could handle himself, and he was very street smart. He had been in vaudeville, he was Charlie Chaplin's stand-in at the movies made in the gold medal studios in the Bronx. So he was a character, and he was a, you know, a great talker, and he was out there all the time. And from my father, I think I saw that you could talk to anybody and it wasn't anything, you know, it wasn't so great to be shy. It was good to be out there and mix it up and not be afraid. And, and, um, and my father made people laugh. And I think I probably got on that wavelength early. And he was also a first-rate athlete, having been a boxer and a dancer. And he played baseball for money on Saturday, so I would go with him. I had a chance to really have a kind of hero worship for my pop, who was a truck driver delivering goods around New York. It's not like he was an acad you know, academic. He was a truck driver. But he had native intelligence, and he could read street life beautifully. And he would say to me many times as a kid, he, he sort of nudged me. We'd be walking down the street, and he'd say, hey, watch that, watch that over there. And I'd look, and two guys would bump into each other, or somebody would start an argument, or someone would fall on the banana peel. You know, it was as if... He could just point and something would happen. I think that that basic, hey, look at that, was a kind of shaping of a sense of wonder in the world and a predictive quality that something might happen. And that something could be funny or tragic or fearful or powerful. Endless, an endless description. So I got that from my father. And you know, that's no small thing because it's not like 
he sat me down to tell me this, it was just what rolled off of him in his natural life. And, and you know, we take our lessons in an unexpected ways when we're kids, you know? You think about, someone once asked me, did you, you know, did you ever hear anything important like a life lesson from your father? And I, I mean, I think, I, 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 well, yeah, once or twice, but for the most part, just by being with him and observing the way he took in the world, that was the life lesson. And who knew that it was gonna wind up as a camera in my hand? You know, I, I had no idea what I would, how I would make that purposeful for myself. But now I see that it was a natural thing. He was um, showing me how rich ordinary life is and how much joy there was in the world. And you know, that's, if you take that in deeply when you're a kid, then you look for it for the rest of your life. And I have to say, this is to all of you out there, not just to you, you, but to everybody. I am grateful for having been out in the world for 58 years, all right, yeah, walking the streets of the world and saying, ah, oh, wow. In other words, stuff has come at me that shows me the wonders of the world the beauties, the harmonies, the tragedies, the joys, all of it just keeps coming. And, and, and as it comes, my reflex has allowed me to bring the Leica up to my eye and press the button and say, yes, thank you. Thank you, world, for giving me one more time to say, ah, and be awestruck by it. And really, everybody, that's all there is to it. If you do that enough, you'll learn how to make a good frame, how to be anticipatory of the moment that's actually unfolding in front of you, and you are literally reading it with your entire sensory apparatus, eyes, ears, heart, physical properties. You're reading the unfolding moment, and the camera just slices away a little piece of it like that. So... If you go out into the world armed with awe, you will be inspired no matter where you are. You won't have to make a vacation to go get a picture. You'll, you'll just be seeing it in the most ordinary place. I'm, I'm plotting here and I realize- <laughs> I've We don't completely... know what plotting. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. My dad, well, we talked about this briefly. My dad grew up in the Bronx same same thing and it was uh, his own kind of ghetto he got into fist fights all the time for anti-semitism and uh he was not a golden gloves champ uh but i think he weighed a lot more than your dad maybe he was a lot slower i don't know but but as once we moved uh we actually i was born in brooklyn so we moved out of the bronx and then we moved a little bit further out on to uh, Long Island, but we used to make fun of my dad because he could just see a sky for the entire his entire life and just be awestruck by it. So I, I think that's just an incredible story. All right, I don't know how the heck I'm going to cover with you. Yeah, this would take a month. Just jump Let's into move that. forward. Let's move forward. It, you're somehow you now call it 22. You you. I don't know how you got to be 22, don't know what you're doing up to that point, but around then, you become a junior madman. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? You become Absolutely. Uh, an I, had, I really was in it. 19, yeah, 1960, I was working for an ad agency in New York, which was in the penthouse of the Plaza Hotel. So every day I went down from the Bronx by subway, I got off at 59th Street, I walked to the Plaza Hotel, I got in the elevator, and up I went to the penthouse of the Plaza Hotel. And it was, I mean, it was, I was cutting mats and doing paste-ups and mechanicals, you know, tiny little ads. You know, I wasn't an art director. I was in what they called the bullpen. You know, I was like the relief guy, you know. Um, when, they, when they needed someone to work on something, they said, hey, get me someone from the bullpen. You know, get me Joel. Joel would come out. Yeah, what do you need, guys? You know, and I would paste up 
some ad for brasiers or for cola or for insurance, you know, stuff like that. But the thing that was amazing was one day the owner of the advertising agency called into the bullpen. He needed someone to schlep some, some uh, boxes of a presentation to another uh, place in Manhattan to the client. And so I was sent with the owner. And you know, we got in a taxi together and everything. And here's this guy, a millionaire, and he's got his own agency. He's got 100 people working for him and me from the Bronx. And we sit in the car, we're talking about things and everything. And it was like guy to guy, you know. And we get to the place and I'm there and, I, and he's going to be talking about these things. And I take the stuff down. Anyway, when it was all over and we're packing it up and we're going back, and he said to me, what do you think? You know, I was such a straight arrow from the Bronx. I said, I don't think they understood the really good one that you showed them. They, they went for something that looked to me like, you know, was ordinary. And he looked at me and he said, which one? I said, well, you know, the one with the two people or whatever the hell it was. And he said, you know, that's my favorite too. I said, well, don't let them use the other one when you got the best one here. You got to make it. me. I'm telling the owner you know, I mean, just so many And he's looking at me the whole time like, who is this? <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, afterwards, I'm thinking, oh, I think I made a mistake. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have been so direct. Well, that was the beginning. He began to call me to come up to all the meetings in, his, in, in the agency with all the account executives, the madmen, the quote, the real madmen. And I would turn the posters and things like that. But then afterwards, he would order dinner from the plaza, from the Oak Room of the plaza, would get sent up and, and a, a little private elevator would enter the, the penthouse and a, a guy would roll a card with a gigantic silver service on it and he would open up dinner and Ben Sackheim and I would sit down I mean, I didn't even know which knife and fork to use, you know what I mean? We'd sit down and have dinner, <laughs> because by this time it could be 10 o'clock at night. And he would ask me, you know, what do you think about it? And, and I, I remember one time I said to him, this is, a, I know I'm going a little around here, but it's important. One time I said to him, these guys seem to me to be playing it safe because they're protecting their mortgage and they're not telling you exactly what they feel and what you need to hear from them. And he looked at me like, again, like, oh. So after a while, I became like his go-to guy. And in, instead of me going home to the Bronx, he would say, why don't you come and stay over at my place on Central Park's West at night, and we'll come to work in the morning. Now, he owned, he owned what William Randolph Hearst built on Central Park West and 60th Street on top of a building, um, William Randolph Hearst brought a castle from England and rebuilt it on Central Park West for his mistress, who was an opera singer, a terrible opera singer. Uh, there's, a, there's a story, there's been a movie about it and everything. Um, and I would sleep in, his, in Ben Sackheim's son's bedroom facing Central Park. Here, I'm a kid from, you know, from the, the ghetto of the Bronx, and now I'm working in the plaza and I'm sleeping in the bedroom on, on Central Park South, West, and in the morning, a, a butler serves breakfast, you know, and I, I, on, the next, on the next door terrace outside of the castle is a, a famous Broadway star who's starring in Damn Yankees, and she's out on the terrace, dancing and singing in the morning and occasionally jumps over the wall to have breakfast with us. So suddenly I was in this whole other world and I wasn't a photographer, but I was seeing the duality. You get out of the subway, but you could also be on top of William Randolph Hearst's castle penthouse. So life became really um, thrilling. And what I learned from this was Say it like it is. Don't try to weasel your way around things. Say what you're thinking and, and you know, deal with the consequences afterwards. And it's the same with seeing. 
you can't just modify. You gotta, you gotta see. You see instantly. You respond instantly. If you hesitate, the photograph that you felt will be gone. So, fortunately, the Leica is one of these cameras that doesn't hesitate. You press the button. Well, the old ones didn't hesitate. Let's be, let's be honest. They didn't hesitate. The new ones are pretty good now, but there was a period when they were hesitating too long and I died a thousand times in that fraction of a second and the button didn't go off. But that's the past. We don't have to deal with that. So well, that's my, just, that's 62. Whoops. I mean, that's 62. No, that's so, 60. So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We now, I want to take us to your origin story the the epiphany the moment so please do tell that story but you've already answered the question i was going to ask you right after that which was what the heck were you thinking when you came back i'm going to stop there and let you tell the story of when you decided to become a photographer yeah so in, in, uh, i by 62 i had moved to another agency a small agency in manhattan um, so I could move up and be an art director instead of in the bullpen. And uh, I designed a booklet. And my senior art director um, assigned a photographer. I didn't know any photographers. <clears throat> I knew nothing about photography. <clears throat> but he assigned a photographer to shoot the book. And the photographer was a guy named Robert Frank. To me, it was just a name. And, uh, and my, my boss you know, had Robert set up the location and everything. And, and uh, I went down to be there to make sure that all the pages of the booklet were covered in the shooting. And <clears throat> Robert paid no attention to me whatsoever. And, I, you know, he, I gave him the booklet. He, he knew what was in there. And he started setting up the shooting. And I stood behind him. And I was fascinated because I was looking over his shoulder at the two young girls he was photographing doing after-school activities. And he barely spoke to them. He used the kind of body language the whole time. And every time some gesture between the girls happened in an interesting way, I would hear a t -t 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 of his like, a t -t 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 like that. And, and I just, oh, because each time the camera went off, the image that I saw was frozen at the apogee of its moment. And I, I, I could see it. The sound made me see the moment clearly. And I, I didn't process what was going on. But then when it was over, I left. It was probably 4.30 or something like that. And... I thought, okay, I'm gonna walk uptown to the office. And as I was walking on the streets of Manhattan, everything I saw seemed to be waiting for people hailing taxi cabs, people burdened with their laundry or their shopping, you know, schlepping the bags along, people carrying the baby in their arms and cooing to the little baby. Everything seemed to have moment as if Oh my God, in the, in, the, in the fluid movement of life, there were intersections. You could cut away pieces of time as it flew by. And when I understood that, it was as if I had begun to process the fact that we could stop a moment of time and and, and live in it, expand it in some way. That made me think that I should stop being a painter because that's what I was, I was a painter. Sort of an action, abstract expressionist, second generation painter. And when I got back to the, to the office, Harry said to me, how was the shoot, Joel? And I said, oh, it was great, Harry, it was great. I'm quitting on Friday. And, and I mean, he looked at me like, huh, you're quitting? I said, yeah, I said, I, I, I'm going to be a photographer. And he said, why? You're, you're an artist. And you're an art director. I said, something about photography that I saw today that I, I need 
to be out on the streets. I cannot be in an office anymore. I, I have to be out on the street. And so he said to me, do you have camera? I was kind of puzzled. I said, no, I, I don't have a camera. He said, well, how are you going to make photographs if you don't have a camera? I said, no, it's a really good question. Well, I, got, I have to get one. He said, wait a second. He opened his drawer and he pulled out his camera, which was a single lens reflex camera at the time. And he said, here, use this camera until you can buy a camera. And so I went out into the street with this you know, clunky single lens reflex Japanese camera. Um, and I started, I started. I waited till the pictures came in. I made sure the book looked good. And then on that Friday, I took my last paycheck and I hit the streets. I didn't know what I was gonna do, you know, because that, that job at the time paid me $55 a week. Nothing. You were rich. <laughs> it was nothing. Let me tell you, it was nothing. You could barely pay your rent and have money left over to eat. But um, I, I had a little money saved up, you know, a few hundred dollars. And I thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to learn to photograph. And I'll figure out something later on. But I have to do what is calling me now. So my first instinct was I needed to do this. And then I figured out a way to do it. And I, I think that's what's at stake for every one of us. It's not the story so much. It's when you recognize something of importance to you, follow your intuition. You'd be lost without it. We live I, on our instinct. This is fantastic. And what I want to do now is because I, I made a promise, an ironclad promise to, to a hard stop. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just share with people a number of images across your different periods. So uh, let's move to the next uh, section uh, that corresponds. So you were in the street from 62 to 64, would you say, as that first period corresponding with what you have in the book? Antonio, well, can we No, I was on, on the street. The I, was on the, I was on the street a I, lot longer. Uh, yes. But, yes. but, you know, Why? I mean, still. But, but uh, you know, I started with color and I was learning how to use color and how to expose for it and how to value it. And, and at a certain point, as this picture will show, I, I, when I finally had a second camera, I was able to buy a Leica, like in 1964. I, and, but all of my friends didn't understand color. They kept on saying, no, black and white is everything. And sure, it was everything then, but I was using color because the world was in color and I didn't know any better. And so I was trying to make an argument for color. And the way I wanted to do it was by showing color pictures. And if there was an opportunity, if the moment was just long enough where I could make two shots, boom, boom, I would try to make a paired picture. I had two 35 millimeter lenses. I, I, tried, to, I tried to do a picture in which uh, you know, I could read the picture and see what is color more interesting or is black and white more interesting? And if color is, why? So very early on, I was posing what was, I think, the essential and crucial question for the early 1960s when nobody was really using color. It's, it's incredible. Um, one of the things that I want to come back to is this notion of one's experiences shape one's eyes. So you had that initial uh, reaction to Robert Frank, but then you took it a step further. You went on the road, which uh, is what Robert Frank had done 10 years earlier. In fact, I love that you have that section of your book entitled On the Road, because it's also uh, a double entendre. Jack Kerouac, the famous beat writer, also produced the forward to Robert Frank's book. And then you made that quite literal and traveled extensively through Europe. Yeah, well, you know, I think, I th I think my generation in particular I was deeply influenced by Robert's dark poem about America. And all of us needed to go out 
and see it for ourselves because it was always changing. And, and you know, Robert caught it in the late 50s and here we were into the 60s now and we were leading up to the Vietnam War and, you know, things were changing and it was important to go out and, and see the country you live in so that you can understand something about your identity and, and what's going on in your country. And the road trip, is it's a great romance for photographers to be out on the road and to be in strange places and see things that you don't see. But I, I had a little advantage in that I went to school in Columbus, Ohio. I went to college in Columbus, Ohio, because they had a great swimming team. And I was on the swimming team in the Bronx when I was in high school, and I wanted to swim for college, and my grades weren't so great that I could get into Yale or Stanford, who also had good teams, but Ohio State had a great swimming team, so I went there, and uh, I was in the Midwest, and I traveled a lot around the Midwest by hitchhiking and by riding the rails, believe it or not, boxcars around the Midwest with a, a woman friend of mine, not my girlfriend, a, a friend, an art, another art student. And we would, we would just get in a boxcar on a Friday night and wind up somewhere on Saturday wow. morning. And, you know, we'd be in Louisville or St. Louis or Cincinnati or, you know, wherever the hell we were. And we would just, you know, scope it all out and then try to figure out how to get back to Columbus in time for Monday. So I, I was used to it in some sense, but I wasn't photographing it. I was just sort of taking in the zeitgeist of the country from that perspective, which is the hobo perspective. And, and she was an incredibly courageous woman, older than me, you know, and just my, just my art school buddy, really. And, and uh, Lois was her name. And, and I, I loved her as a friend. You know, she just, she, in a way, she taught me a little bit about how to be a man, you know, because she was so risky risk-taking. So that was great. Uh, but it inspired me to take road trips when I started making photographs to really get on the road. Well, I, I'm so upset that there's so much more I want everyone to see, but okay, this was a little bit overly ambitious. And we have five minutes left. Is you that promised it? me Well, if you, you can go longer, if you want to go a little longer, um, I'll go a little longer with you. I can go a little longer. I mean, it's up to you, you. Happy to go longer. Wow. Well, that would be amazing. What we're looking at right now are several of the images that you took with the Deerdorf uh, up in Provincetown. Antonio, can you go to the portraits uh, yeah. for a um, minute? There's my, one friend Mas my friend Massimo Cristaldi just wrote in, go longer. So, okay. Okay, okay Massimo. Okay. I'll, I'll twist their arm. Right. Well, I, I chose a number of these uh, pictures because they resonated with me in such a profound way. We'll talk about that offline. But of all of your portraits, the one portrait that just leapt off the page to me was of this young woman in the middle of a party. And I, I like to say that you can always tell something about the relationship between the subject and the photographer, even if it's only in a fleeting moment. But this image just knocked my socks off and you took it with an eight by 10 camera with a long exposure. Where were you in your life when you took this shot, Joel? I have to ask. Well, I had just begun shooting with the eight by 10 a matter of weeks before. So I didn't really know the camera very well at that point. I was, um, I was learning to take all kinds of risks. It wasn't just shooting landscapes, you know? And I carried the camera with me everywhere I went. And so someone invited me to this cocktail party in Wellfleet. You know, the camera came, I came off the beach where I had been photographing and swimming. And, and then I came to the party and um, at some point in the party, you know, everybody's moving around. You could see some people are actually in motion. That shows how long the exposure is. And I'm standing in the party and I see this incredibly beautiful young woman 
leaning against the tree. And, you know, it's a party for older people, mostly cocktail party. And she's like 17 and everybody else is in their 40s. <laughs> and, and I could see that she had sort of dropped out for a second. And I, I had the camera up on its sticks. You know, I always carried it full out. And I, I quickly framed it. And then I just whispered across the space to her, caught her attention. I said, just stay as you are. That's all I said to her, no more. I put a sheet of film in, you know, she looked at the camera. I made the exposure, which was probably a half to a second, you know, because I was risking, I was trying to not lose it with everybody moving. That wouldn't have been fun. But I figured she's leaning against the tree, she'll hold still. And so I got the picture. And, and uh, what I saw was how a young person sometimes is lost in their own, um, you know, way of their own life. And they don't quite relate to everybody and they drop out of the social mix. And so we had that connection at that moment. Now there's a crazy, I know her now, she's one of, like, one of the board members of Aperture. She's uh, become a friend over the years. But what you don't know in this picture is that a few years later, I'm gonna tell a story. A few years later, I had a show and I published this book. And then one day I get a call and I, I, it's like a gangster was on the line. I said, is this Joe Amayowitz? I said, yes. He said, you know that picture you have of that girl in the party? I said, yes. He said, I want that picture. And I said, well, okay, you can go to my gallery. Leave. He said, no, no, no. I want that picture and I'd like you to bring it to me. I said, well, but I have a gallery to do that. He said, look, my name is so-and-so and I'm the chairman of the board of Warner Pictures. <laughs> he said, and I want you to come to my office on the top of Rockefeller Center and I'll buy you a sandwich. He said, and you can bring me this picture. I said, well, what's your interest in the picture? He said, that's my granddaughter. He said, and you have revealed her to the family in a way that we never saw. And so we understand something about her now. She's a teenager, but now, and this is how he talks. He talks like, you know, Martin Scorsese. I said, he was talking like that. So I go up and I have lunch with the chairman of the board of Warner Brothers. <laughs> Pastrami sandwich. Good choice. From the, stage, from the stage deli. And good choice again. And and we're sitting around talking about life and everything. And and he says, So what do you want? I said, What do you mean? What do I want? Pastrami sandwich is fine. He said, No, uh, what do you want? We've got we do books, we have hotels, we do movies. I said, Okay, I'll direct a blockbuster. If you let me, I'll direct a blockbuster for you and I'll do one of two things. I'll either cost you a lot of money and we'll lose everything, or I'll make a picture that might just be a world favorite. It's a gamble. And he said to me, you're crazy. Don't do that. You're an artist. They'll eat you alive in Hollywood. You don't want to do this, Joel. Save yourself, please. And then he calls out to her father, who is upstairs in his office, and he yells up to Steve Ross. He says, Steve! You gotta come down here and see this photograph of your, your daughter. He said, and this guy wants to make a Hollywood movie. And Steve Ross, the head of Warner Brothers production, yells down, he's crazy. <laughs> what an outstanding, an outstanding <laughs> story. I had no idea. <laughs> All from this wow. But you see, that's, wow. what it, that's what it is with photography, somebody has a passionate moment. In this case, it was the grandfather, but it could be someone who just loves the place or something like that. And then they enter your life if you're an artist and maybe something comes of it. So another chance, another layer of chance is revealed. And so you have a chance to play the game on another layer. And life is meant to be lived and to have fun. And photography has been fun for me, even at its most serious. Even when I was in the middle of ground zero doing all that work, there was enough everyday stimulation, beauty and, and, and moment and humor, dark humor, 
all of it made me so excited. Like I was there 12, 14 hours a day because it was so fantastic. I couldn't, I couldn't leave. So that's, that's what an incredible story. Doing. Yeah. Well, so let's just f uh, forward, Antonio, if you could pull up the photograph from Aftermath uh, of the World Trade Center. And Joel, I want to uh, thank you for going past, but I still want to be mindful of your time. I want to share this image. And then, although this wasn't the image that you chose for uh, Cape, uh, not Cape Light, but for your other book, to juxtapose with Tuscany, there is something about that juxtaposition between as bad as it gets and maybe as good as it gets. Because I think we should at least show these two photographs and have you talk about them. And then, but let's only do that if you promise you will still answer my question. What's the question? I was talking about this first. Okay. All right. So, I had been, my wife Maggie and I had been commissioned to do a book on Tuscany because we had taught in Tuscany for like six summers, uh, a workshop in Tuscany, writing and photography. And my publisher in New York said, oh, do a book on Tuscany. And I was supposed to go away in October. And instead, after 9-11, I decided to spend my time in New York and I was spending the advance money for the book on, on digging myself out of ground zero. But at some point he called up and he said, hey, uh, have you gone to Tuscany? I said, no, we didn't go to Tuscany. We're in, we're in ground zero. I'm in ground zero doing this work, which is more important to me right now. And he said, you got to go to Tuscany one of these days. I said, I will. When, it, when it's quiet here, when I've had two or three months in this, I'll go to Tuscany. So, and in, in, the, in the winter of 2002, in January of 2002, so I already had been down inside the site for three and a half months, I went to Tuscany. And what happened was that in Tuscany, I was in a normal world. People plowed the earth, they planted, you know, uh, uh, the fields were tilled. And they had been doing this for thousands of years in Tuscany. And suddenly I was reminded, well, we were both reminded because Maggie was writing essays about this. We were both reminded that the world is essentially a good place. We live on this paradise of a planet. And although we are screwing it up major, we still live on it and it still has its seasons and its beauties. And so it restored my faith in, in the goodness of the, of the world and in mankind. And um, it allowed us to write essays and make pictures that showed the alternate reality. And it was a way for us to say, let's remember that the world is still a good place regardless of acts of terrorism and, and murder. It is basically a good place. And I, I want to show you what exists now as a kind of antidote to the poison. And then I would go back after spending two or three weeks in Tuscany, I would go back and get right into my gear and go into Ground Zero and spend another two months or three months in Ground Zero and then go away again for a few weeks. So I had this, you know, sort of seesaw between the two. And it was restorative for me, but it also made me understand that when I finished this work in Ground Zero, the changes that I was going through would have an effect on me in the sense that I felt it would be important in the future to do works that were not self-involved, but that often had some kind of social value in them. And, and I think it's important to alternate. If I was in America now, not just during the pandemic, but during the Trump era, I would be out photographing this incredible chain when democracy's uh, foundation is being challenged and, and seems to be 
you know, corrupted in such a way. Who's photographing out there? I hope there are young artists who are out there showing us what what divisions we're facing in, in you know, in the midst of a, a you know a deathly pandemic and and the loss of, of you know <laughs> jobs in America and a, a crushing income loss of the economy. Aren't there people photographing this the way Robert photographed America? The way Gary photographed you know, America? I hope so. There, there, there are. And the, one of the first people who come to mind is a, a young man named Devin Allen, who is actually in the midst of protests. Two of his uh, photographs have made the cover of Time magazine. But I, I agree with you completely. I, uh, I can't be in New York. I can't be in New York. Uh, it's not just about my life, but it's not just about statistics. It's about also expected value calculations. But I agree, we are at an inflection point, one, once in a century kind of inflection point. So I, I think that's, there's nothing more important. So. With that, I now want to ask you the question again. I think you've teed it up just in an incredible way. And that is not as a photographer, but as Joel Meyerowitz, who has been on this mortal coil more than eight decades, the, the educator, the philosopher poet, if there is one thing that you want to communicate the, the one truth or the one piece of advice, one human being to another that you want to share. What is it? That's a tightrope question, you know, and the tightrope is strung across two skyscrapers, like Philip Petit when he walked across the yes, the world yes, the French, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if we're talking about photography, which is what this question is aimed at, I would say that as human beings, we are gifted with an incredible visual scope. We can feel, I'm looking straight at the camera, I can see my fingers wiggling without moving my eyes. Maybe it's because I'm looking at the picture. Oh, no, I can see my fingers with you. So we are, as human beings, incredibly binocular. You know, we've got a great um, scan. And with that comes the development of finely tuned survival instincts. And instinct is what underscores the making of photographs. Impulse and instinct. And too often, we narrow our instincts down to do things that have already been done. There was once a well-known educator artist in the mid-20s and 30s in, in America named Robert Henri. And he, he taught. Uh, he was part of, I think, the in school or just before. And he once said, we are not here to do what has already been done. And when I learned that in art school, I actually did handmade calligraphy of that sign. And I put it up over my bed so that every day when I got up to go out to school, I saw we are not here to do what has already been done. And it's that way in photography too. Now you can't help yourself because the frame is the same frame for everybody, just about. 35 millimeter is 35 millimeter. But you can fill that frame with your own intuition, the thing that calls you. If you listen clearly to the heartbeat of your impulse and your instinct, if you do not hesitate, you bring the camera up, and it doesn't matter what the frame is like, you know. It's, it's go okay to make crappy frames at first. As long as the information is in there, you might actually succeed in making an interesting photograph. And it will, 
teach you to tune yourself, your instrument of yourself, so that you'll be faster and closer and better and your timing and understanding and all of this will be more effective. And by accumulating these instincts and laying them out on X contact sheets or on your screen in Lightroom or whatever you use, you'll begin to see the accumulated understandings that you have arrived at. And therein lies your wisdom. That's you. It's a reflection of the things that you hold dear or important or meaningful, necessary, lively. Your spontaneity and understanding are cohesive in that moment. And the only way you can find your identity as an artist, and as a human being, through photography is to look at these pictures and read them for the truth of your singularity, your instinct. It's the simplest thing. You are armed with it as a basic native, you know, intelligence. But we sometimes fail to use it in the truest way. We modify it so that it looks like somebody else's work or something you saw on Instagram or something you saw in a book. And I say, screw that. You make your mistakes because your mistakes will be your education. So if I could, if that's what I have to offer, I, you know, take from it what you can, but it's how I've lived my life by believing in, in this native instinct. Thank you for that. All right. I, I, okay. Normally I'm reasonably coherent. I'm just verklempt from all of this, but guys, again, if only two books, really pick up Cape light. And if you want to really think through how much you have in your life, here's the book that I recommend among all of them uh, by Joel, because it serves as an inspiration for figuring out all of the stories and experiences and how you can mine them for your own artistic voice. It's called Where I Find Myself. And of course, if you want to go a little bit deeper, but you guys mostly have yeah. this already. <clears throat> hey, so, would, it be, would it be okay for me to just add a, a note to everybody out there? Because a, a book certainly is, I mean, I've used books all my life to learn from, you know? And in my day, the books were very few. You know, I had three books. I had Cartier Bresson's The Sights of Moment, Walker Evans' American Photographs, and Robert Frank's The Americans. Those were three books in 1962. It wasn't like a lot of books like today, we got thousands. But recently I made with uh, um, the Masters of Photography online, five and a half hours of courses, modules. There's 35 modules. They run four or five minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. But it's a, it's a talking, it's like a talking book. And, and I, I, if, if you're interested in upping your game, um, this is something you might want to, you know, it's not terribly expensive and, uh, you know, you spend more on a couple of meals out. But um, I, I really try to make it an intimate personal experience in which uh, I try to say everything that you and I would like to say to you over the next five and a half hours, but it's not going to work. <laughs> um, I, I will vouch i will vouch for this i i bought it myself it is the best online course in the genre i have ever taken and i i'm not saying that for any other reason than it is absolutely the way that i feel joel's humanity comes through uh the wisdom of all of those decades comes through and it also dresses a number of points that we didn't get to, like the fact that although photography is generally thought of as a very singular uh, uh, occupation or preoccupation, there is also room for collaboration. And he gets into that in the most wonderful way. Joel, 
Thank you, man. I knew this was going to be great. What a pleasure. What a privilege. And thanks so much for going a little bit longer with us. My, my pleasure. I'm only sorry I couldn't answer some of the questions that people are putting in, but maybe we'll have a follow-up someday. I would love that. Thank you. you. You're really wonderful to have a conversation with. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody at NICA, too. My, my great support system. Ciao.